Um, welcome to my channel. I'm Nicole Coco Patrice or Nicole Patrice or whatever the hell my name is on here. Um, and so today, um, we gonna talk a little bit more about the migrant crisis in Chicago. Um, well, a few things. Um, but the main thing is what came out recently um, today. Uh, let's see. <laughs> let's start with this because I found this to be quite ironic. I think ironic is the word. This morning, Ooh. ahead of the storm uh, in the forecast, police were called oh, after. It's been busy. It's been busy. Now, here in the city, chaos breaks out as migrants desperately seek shelter. A melee broke out at an East Village processing center this morning. That is where our Stephanie Bertini is live right now with the latest. And Stephanie, what happened there? Arthur, well, right now it's cold out here. It's windy. It's wet. During this kind of weather, the most vulnerable are most at risk. Here in New York City, that includes migrants and the homeless population, and that can translate into a range of emotions. We saw evidence of that here earlier today. Volunteers at Tompkins Square Park are helping migrants get some things that could offer a little comfort in the face of the harsh weather in the forecast tonight. They hand us some food and this to keep us warm because it's very cold out here. This man from Guinea, West Africa, is one of the many asylum seekers in New York City now facing uncertainty as shelters are at capacity. On a night like this, that uncertainty can create a range of emotions, including fear. And you're not used to this weather, right? We are not. We are not. This is a strange environment. Earlier today, emotions were high not too far from the park in front of the former St. Bridget School, now operating as a shelter reentry center for migrants during this crisis, as limits on shelter stays were imposed by the city months ago. There are literally hundreds every day lined up around the block, all the way to the next block and around the corner. This morning, ahead of the storm and the forecast, police were called after an altercation broke out. The NYPD says two officers sustained minor injuries and two migrants are facing several charges now, including resisting arrest. According to a witness, it had to do with someone cutting the line. They are not respecting the line. That's why the problem happened, he said. The Department of Homeless Services says tonight a code Ellos no respeten la fila? Ellos no respeten la fila? They not respecting the line, guys. Wow. The irony. People across the border. Okay, y'all gonna say that y'all seeking asylum. Okay, whatever. But all these people ain't seeking asylum. The numbers are not numbering, but okay. Um, but okay, so you don't, you cut the line, but he cut the line. This is where this is going. Everyone's cutting everyone. Like that. I thought that's what we were doing. So you, you wanted, you wanted somebody in this line to respect the line when you didn't cut the line of all the lines. Make it make sense. Okay. I just thought that was super ironic. Blue is in place, meaning if you need a warm bed, you should be able to access one. But with the overflow in shelters between the migrant population and the homeless in New York City, there are doubts. In a statement from Housing Justice for All, thousands of our homeless neighbors, including families and children, will be forced to endure freezing temperatures on the streets today. Some may die. And of course, as the weather gets worse tonight, anything can help. Outreach workers are out making sure those who need a warm place can get to it. Arthur, back to you inside. All right, thank you very much, Stephanie. Well, the federal AV, oh, as the storm continues, rather, head to fox5ny.com for the latest forecast, projected snow totals, school closings, and more. Search fox5ny in your app store. Whoops. All right. So, yeah. <laughs> like, no. <sighs> so, yeah, to me, 
absolutely insane that, um, yeah, that they are not understanding the concept of like when you make your way to a country with no plans, with no sponsor to receive you as per, you know, asylum policy normally, right? That you're going to end up in circumstances where you are unhoused. Like, I don't know where in the equation being unhoused was overlooked, potentially being unhoused was overlooked because based on government response, obviously you're not going to get anything. And, you know, you should have an idea of this being that you're fleeing economic and political persecution in a government that supposedly is far worse than ours. So, um, I don't, I don't know why you thought it'd be much better. Um, because as shown, you know what? Let me just show you, actually. <laughs> Let me just show you why. No, no puede tener confianza en nuestro gobierno porque es nuestro gobierno no tiene nada en lugar. <laughs> nada en puesto. <laughs> okay? It's like everything is just being thrown together. Okay? Last minute. So much so that we're doing stuff like this. Make it make sense. I'm gonna give you my number one tip to get over a breakup and that is gonna be going to therapy. Going to therapy helped me so, so much. It could help for so- New York City has and will continue to do our part to manage this humanitarian crisis. But we cannot bear the course of reckless political ploys from the state of Texas alone. <laughs> I just have to always make sure I stop for you to think about that. States cannot create federal immigration policy. That's why Greg Abbott has one of his um, laws about arresting migrants that's supposed to be enforced, I believe, beginning February or March, um, that you cannot um, enforce federal immigration laws as a... Um, a state, you know, or yeah, a state. So, but as cities, you have the right because you were, you know, convinced by churches in the seventies to adopt these sanctuary policies um, and have waited for churches to step up in the way that they called for, you know, back then allegedly, but want the cities and governments and taxpayers to pay for it. Separation of church and state. Who said that? Oh, oh. anyway, sanctuary, like a church sanctuary city. Okay. Anyway. So, you know, behold, we're all here to, uh, assist and accommodate. Right. And then you continue to throw this half truth around about a political ploy from the governor of Texas, but there is no ploy on your end when you do the exact same things. Oh, let me let you finish washing my bad. Today, our administration filed a lawsuit against 17 companies that have taken part in Texas Governor Greg Abbott's scheme to transport tens of thousands of migrants to New York City in an attempt to overwhelm our social services system. These companies have violated... Do you hear this spin? Okay. Are y'all hearing the spin? In an attempt to, what do you say, overwhelm our systems? Um, our social services system. To overwhelm our migrants to New York City. Of thousands of migrants to New York City. In an attempt to overwhelm our social services system. In an attempt to overwhelm our social services systems. So, Greg Abbott is intentionally... Sending migrants to Eric Adams's city, not because they have sanctuary status, not because they keep talking about right to shelter or they were advertising it at the time. But now it seems like the tune has changed a little bit, a little bit. Sound like he's, eh, eh, it hurts. <laughs> it's giving, eh, stop, make it stop. 
make it stop, please, Greg Abbott. But guess what? Greg Abbott cannot create or enforce federal immigration law or policy. So he's supposed to deal with the folk in his state. Because remember, he's a state on the interior of the United States. He's supposed to deal with these people that have already broken federal immigration law. But you're not supposed to deal with it, being that you're like, oh, no, that's cool. (laughs) These companies have violated state law by not paying the cost of caring for these migrants. And that's why we are suing to record. Buses. I get on, I I remember once I got on like a Metro or Amtrak and missed my stop. I wonder, I wonder if I could have sued the train company for like meals that I missed that day. (laughs) For illegally shipping me (laughs) to a different destination. I wanted America, but not like this America. Oop, too far. <laughs> oh, it's free up there. Mm. Oh, they have room. Oh, also considerably interesting. Hmm, points were made. Take me to this place. Eric Adams's New York City, you say? Sanctuary status sounds amazing. Sounds just beautiful. It's exactly what I need right now. Right? Is this not what I mean? I'm I'm just trying to figure out where how do buses create federal immigration policy? How do you sue a bus company for executing their contract? <laughs> because you don't like the people that got off the bus. Mm, sounds racist. <laughs> Are you stopping subway trains to be like, mm, do you, are these people all going to eat today? <laughs> I haven't seen you. <laughs> I haven't seen you down in the subway, Eric Adams. Were you down in the subway? Huh? Uh, you know, on the on the B train, the J train or one of them, you know, were you down there? Were you down there offering meals? Did you sue? Did you sue the MTA? <laughs> What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing, sir? This makes no sense. And and we're going to continue to find out. Coop, approximately $700 million already spent to care for migrants bus here. The $700 million you spent on your own accord. Nobody told you to do that. Here in the last two years by the state of Texas. Governor Abbott's continuing use of migrants as political pawns is not only chaotic and inhumane, they weren't they weren't pawns when you were like, yo, y'all crazy. Y'all want to close the border. Like, what's wrong with y'all? Y'all can't take care of migrants. Everyone's a human. There's no such thing as an illegal human being. There's no such thing as an illegal. There's no such thing as not enough room. <laughs> There's no such thing as we 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 don't have enough. Chicago says there's enough to go around. I don't know what Denver was saying, but they were saying similar things, I'm sure, right? So sanctuary for all, right? That's what you are asking for. Texas didn't ask for that, but they just so happened by geography to be in the position to take the brunt of this federal policy that you will acknowledge as long as it doesn't put blame anywhere near a Democrat, anywhere near the Biden administration. Correct? Am I right? But makes clear he puts politics over people. Today's lawsuit should serve as a warning to all those who break the law in this way. Whatever you Uh give today. Oh, not this mug popped up on my screen. I'm melting. Whatever you can give today, some strong advice, son. Give up. <laughs> Chip in monthly. Give up now. <laughs> and not they, not they trying to encourage him not to debate. <laughs> Talk about Dick Durbin. I told y'all it's in the name. <laughs> Dick Durbin said, "Don't debate Trump. You're just gonna give him a stage to be anti." I think I, I think I linked that one too. Ay por Dios. Y'all weird. Okay, so let me let me let me get back to focus. I'm roasting Biden now. I'm ahead of myself. But he is who needed 
This is clearly chipping now, chipping now, you mother. Yeah, chipping now. Your, your freaking son is sniffing now. <laughs> Bars. All right. Um. So yeah, you're suing a bus company because you know buses have a duty to like consider the welfare of the people they've transported to their destination. That's in- totally insane. It's unprecedented. You are losing that lawsuit. <laughs> I don't even need to look at any other law journals. Like I don't need to think about it. <laughs> Whoever advised you is an idiot. <laughs> and and all of New York should be upset at them wasting your fucking time and your fucking tax dollars. I'm sorry. I was really trying to hold that in. All right. <laughs> Incredible. Ay, por Dios. It's like, como es real? Like, como es, qua, que es la realidad? Oh, I got to sign in. Y'all can't see this type secret stuff. All right. New York City sues bus companies for $700 million over migrants sent from Texas. The lawsuit says Texas has sent more than 33,000 migrants to the city since 2022. So he's not sending Texas. I mean, he's not suing Texas. He's suing the bus companies. <laughs> Talk about a loser. All right. New York City filed a lawsuit against 17 transportation companies that brought migrants to the city. Excuse me. Um, that brought migrants to the city from Texas, seeking to recoup the roughly seven hundred million the city had. The city said it has spent on those migrants' care, um, <laughs> on their own accord, obviously. Well, due to their right to shelter laws, which clearly, clearly did not take into account a potential failure of the federal government to enforce national border security. But okay, whatever. Um, the suit filed by the commissioner of the city's department of social services relies on a law requiring, requiring anyone who knowingly brings or causes to be brought a needy person from out of the state into this person, into the state for the purpose of making him a public charge to either transport that person out of the state or pay for his or her care. Texas Governor Greg Abbott, a Republican, has been sending migrants to several cities for more than a year, posing challenges for local officials. The lawsuit said at least 33,600 migrants have been sent to New York City from Texas since spring of 2022. Abbott's office didn't immediately respond to requests for a comment. The new, I'm sorry, excuse me, New York City has and will always do our part to manage this humanitarian crisis, but we cannot bear those costs of reckless political ploys from the state of Texas alone. New York City Mayor Eric Adams, a Democrat, said Thursday, New York Governor Kathy Hochul, a Democrat voiced her support for the city's lawsuit. Governor Abbott continued to use human beings as political pawns, and it's about time that the companies facilitating his actions take responsibility for their role in this ongoing crisis, she said. Y'all are ridiculous. So the law says anyone who knowingly brings causes to be brought a needy person from out of the state into this state for the purpose of making him a public charge to either transport that person out of the state or pay for his or her care. I wonder, can I pull this up? Give me a segundo. All righty, baby. You know, I like to find the law. I like to find the law. All right, let's do this. So, muéstrame algo, por favor, gracias. Okay. All right. New York Social Services Law, Section 149, however, requires that any person who knowingly brings or causes to be brought a needy person from out of the state into the state for the purpose of making him a public charge shall be obligated to convey such person out of state or support him at his own expense. So, let's see if I can... Let's find the meat of the law. I see it down there, but I just want to pull this, whatever this source is. All right. So 
Yeah. Mayor Adams announced a suit against Texas charter bus company seeking $708 million to cover cost of caring for migrants transported to New York City. And this is a January 4th, 2024 article from NYC.gov, Office of the Mayor News, right? All right, so this... Um, watch Mayor Adams talk about the suit. Talk about political ploys. Corporation Council today announced 17 charter bus and transportation companies that seek to recoup all costs New York City has incurred providing emergency shelter and services to migrants transported by the charter bus companies, totaling at least approximately $708 million in the last 20 months. Since the spring of 2022, Texas Governor Greg Abbott has admitted to facilitating the transport of more than 33,600 migrants to New York City without having the companies transporting these migrants pay for the cost of continued care in violation of New York's social services law. Today's suit seeks to recoup the hundreds of millions of dollars incurred to care for all these individuals, costs moving forward for any of those migrants still in New York City's care, and costs for all those who are transported to New York City from Texas in the future. <laughs> As part of Governor Abbott's plan. His plan! This is evil! His evil, evil plan! Ah, just an evil man! How does how does he sleep? Ay, my Dios mio. Okay. New York City has and always will do our part to manage this humanitarian crisis. Okay, so he... That's the part we read it already. So let's get down to... These companies have violated the law by not paying their costs for caring. That's why we're suing. Okay, that's them talking. I want to get to the 17 defendants. Uh, in lawsuit, knowingly implemented his... Right. Without any regard for the individuals they were transporting or an effort to help manage this humanitarian crisis. Like, since when is it their responsibility? Rather, it has been bad faith conduct. If anyone's facilitated them being a public charge, it's Joe Biden. But OK, sir, carry on. Um New York Social Services Law. Okay, so here we go. The statute expressly authorizes the commissioner of New York City Department of Social Services, DSS, to sue to recover those costs. Mm. <laughs> Today's lawsuit seeks repayment of all costs, including shelter, food, health care, and more, totaling at least approximately $708 million for all those for all of the more than 33,600. Okay, so we got that. As long as as well as the costs who continue to be sent in the future. Together with New York City's law department, uh sorry, yeah, Department of Law, Paul Weiss, Rifkin, Rifkin, uh, Wharton and Wharton and Garrison LLP is representing the DSS commissioner in the lawsuit led by firm chair Brad S. Carp partner Michelle Hirschman, a special counsel and former DSS commissioner Stephen Banks. For too long, Governor Greg Abbott has chosen to play politics with people's lives. Um, da -da -da -da. I'm just trying to see who's talking because I really don't care if it's Eric Adams again. <laughs> For too long, Governor Greg Abbott has chosen to play politics with people's lives, putting migrants through unimaginable conditions. Uh, and circumstances. Now, the bus and transportation companies contracted by the state of Texas must be held accountable for their participation in f furthering this his excuse me reckless actions," said First Deputy Mayor Sheena Wright. Oh God! Today's <laughs> lawsuit represents part of a larger series of proactive actions of administration. Our administration, excuse me, is taking to continue to successfully manage this humanitarian crisis largely on our own. The bus company is participating in Governor Abbott's diabolical scheme to break New York City's already strained social services system by abandoning tens of thousands of migrants in our city, in our care, and at our cost. They are acting inhumanely, and they're breaking our laws, said Chief Advisor Chaplain Ingrid P. Lewis Martin. With this lawsuit, we aim to recoup the approximately $708 million in costs we've already incurred to provide emergency shelter and care to the migrants who these 17 bus companies have transported to New York City. These companies have that have decided to partner with Gre Governor Abbott should bear the costs associated with the care of the migrants. Baby, if they don't know nothing else, they better know that capitalism reigns and this will start a landslide of issues that you will never see the end of. Baby, if this goes, if this goes anywhere and it gets it's gonna get if it doesn't get dismissed, 
if it actually receives any sort of judgment, <laughs> it's going to the Supreme Court of the state for sure. And somebody's going to overturn this like on appeal, like qu easily quit playing with me. Anywho, the bus companies, I mean, I haven't even read the law yet, but I'm just saying this is so ridiculous. Um, I'm sorry. Since uh, April 2022, New York City has allocated billions of dollars to provide food, shelter, and more to more than 164,000 asylum seekers. These efforts have had an impact on every service our city provides, said Chief of Staff Camille Joseph Varlack. Tens of thousands of those asylum seekers have come to our city through charter bus companies that saw this as a lucrative opportunity to earn Texas government contracts. They knowing, excuse me, they wrongly assumed that their obligations to these asylum seekers stopped after they got off the buses. <laughs> this is crazy. Listen to how y'all are talking. Ooh, you ain't know you gave them people a ride, but now you paying for their whole life. How sweet. Ay, Dios mío. Oh, my God. They gonna, So he's, you know what? If anything, this is like, it's going to force them to look. So it's like they obviously couldn't work their um, right to shelter issue. And so this is the easiest low-hanging fruit, right? But I don't think that they think this is going to stick. I think that they think this is going to pose, like, whatever the remedy for this is going to then bring now back into question the right to shelter law. And so they're like forcing the issue from another side. That's how I feel about it, but I could be wrong. Um, the case is part of New York City's effort to deal with a growing national humanitarian crisis, said Corporation Counsel Heinz Radix. This lawsuit seeks to enjoin these companies from participating in an unlawful scheme and hold them fully accountable. Each week, thousands of individuals, families newly arriving to the city come through our system seeking a path to the American dream, often without coordination for a warning from their prior entry point in the United States and lacking the basic necessities of food and access to medical care, said Deputy Mayor for Health and Human Services Ann Williams Isom. Excuse me. Um, the Texas state government has to this point intentionally sent people seeking asylum to New York City and has done so without coordination with city officials. Aww. Today's lawsuit uh, seeks to hold parties involved in that action accountable for participating in that effort and to recoup associated costs incurred by the city. We will continue to act to meet our obligations, but we will also seek opportunities to hold those accountable at every step of the process. Oh, but not at the first step, which would have been at the border, which would have been the federal government, which would have been, ooh, you got to say it. Say his name, say his name when no one is around you. <laughs> anyway, um, so for nearly two years, our incredible city workers have stepped up. Okay, blah, blah, blah. So they're crying as usual. Um, Y'all can go read that, obviously, on New York's uh nyc.gov office of the mayor whatever whatever all right so today's lawsuit builds on executive order 538 issued by mayor adams last week that requires improved coordination it requires improved coordination y'all are scrambling eric is getting oh my god Ugh. i, I don't want to say it but you guys know i mean visualize it it's happening to him Joe Biden <laughs> and Abbott. <laughs> Today's lawsuit built on uh, Executive Order 538 issued by Mayor Adams last week that requires improved coordination from charter bus companies transporting new migrant arrivals into New York City, ensuring the safety and well-being of both migrants and staff city staff receiving them. Indeed, many of the bus companies sued today are the same companies that are now evading compliance with the executive order by busing migrants to New Jersey train stations and then having the migrants take a train to New York City. 
What was that? Jurassic Park? Nature finds a way. <laughs> Nature finds a way. Between April 2022 and December 23, the city has already spent an estimated $3.5 billion on shelter and services for the over 164 thousand five hundred individuals who have come through the city's intake center as the adams administration continues to prioritize helping migrants live independently without significant or timely state and federal assistance the city plans to pursue a 20 percent reduction in city funded spending on the migrant crisis in the fiscal year 2024 preliminary budget which will be released later this month it's always interesting how the city wants you know, to make money off of us, right? And to find money, you know, for, for what they want by having a hand out, but then they can't rely on federal assistance. <laughs> the migrants can't rely on federal and state assistance, but y'all can. <laughs> Come on, New York City. <laughs> make your own money. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Okay. As the Adams administration con continues to prioritize helping migrants live independently without significant or timely state and federal assistance, the city plans to sue a 20 pursue, excuse me, a 20% reduction to city funded spending on the migrant crisis in the fiscal year 2024 pre preliminary budget, which will be released later this month. So sounds like they're dialing it back a little bit because things aren't going according to Oh, plans you didn't make because no one coordinated with you, which should have been Joe Biden coordinating with you, not a Texas governor. Okay. But Joe Biden don't even want to talk to you. Have you seen him, Eric? Have you seen him? No. <laughs> Okay, between, um, excuse me, since this humanitarian crisis began, uh, the city has taken fast, urgent action, opening more than 210 emergency sites, including 18 large-scale humanitarian relief centers to provide shelter to migrants, standing up to navigation centers with support from community-based organizations to connect new arrivals with critical resources, enrolling thousands of children in post schools through Project Open Arms, opening application help centers that have helped submit over 25,000 asylum temporary protected status and work authorization applications and more. Last spring, the city released a road forward, a blueprint to address New York City's response to the asylum seeker crisis, detailing how the city will continue to manage the influx of asylum seekers and advocate for the support of, from, excuse me, from federal and Advocate for support from federal and state partners. We're going to keep begging. Please, have you seen them? No, Biden, oh, why did you open the border and let them come on in at once? Oh, I've been used to having someone to lean on, but I'm lost. Biden, I'm lost. Oh, ba 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 Have you seen him? Tell me, have you seen him? Have you seen them? <laughs> okay. <laughs> no! I'm sorry, I had to do it one more time. I really was trying not to do that last no. <laughs> because no! <laughs> Ciao, help them. Because of the storm, the city's decided to evacuate the migrant shelter at Floyd Bennett Field. They've been temporarily relocated to James Madison High School in Sheepshead Bay. That's where Fox 5 Jessica Formoso joins us live right now. Uh, Jess, have you been able to talk to anyone impacted by this? Who thought tents would make it, bro? Like, I'm just really trying to figure out what is, what is there in there. What's in there? <laughs> I don't get it. Like, I don't get why tents were the answer at all, at all. Like, we're talking about climate change. We're talking about all this stuff going on. And 
uh, I guess he's he, he was out of he was out of places, guys guys. But y'all found somewhere for him to go as an emergency. Brandon Johnson's like, why y'all ain't been used to damn school? I would have put kicked the kids out and put them in there <laughs> today. <laughs> Good evening, Natasha and Steve. Yes, I have. I spoke to a few migrants that have arrived here. Now, we arrived just before 4 p.m., and we saw some families standing outside the high school. Of course, it was already raining at the time. Then they were allowed inside, and they tell us that they came on their own. Uh, they were notified that they had to leave uh, Floyd Bennett Field just a few hours ago. Now, take a look at this video. This is from over there from the fields. This is when we saw the migrants leaving uh, Floyd Bennett Field. The reason they have to evacuate is because of the storm. A spokesperson for City Hall telling Fox 5 that due to an updated forecast, including the high winds tonight, this relocation is what they're calling a proactive measure being taken out of an abundance of caution to ensure the safety and well-being of individuals working and living at the center. Now, we are talking about almost 2,000 migrants who will have to evacuate the field. According to the migrants here at James Madison High School, buses will start transporting folks from the field to the high school starting at around to 5 p.m. Some decided to come on their own, though, because they say it's going to be chaos, the amount of people that need to get on a bus in order to get here. The migrants were supposed to arrive at the high school after school programs concluded for the day, but that has not been the case. We saw migrants and their families going into the building way before children were dismissed. One parent telling us off camera that their child's practice was canceled because of this. That said, this location is what the city is calling a rest but shelter just for tonight. However, the people we spoke to tell us that this was last minute. They do understand why they're coming here, but they say it's a bit of a mess and, of course, even a messier situation because of the rain and the storm. It's uncomfortable for us. The kids are in school. We have to pull them out to come here. This weather gets the kids sick. Let's see how it goes. I just want to find a job so we can be stable. We found out about all this about an hour and a half ago. Now, according to the city, the migrants... Damn, we don't control the weather here in the U.S. <laughs> or at least that's what they tell us, still. <laughs> But I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, señor, it was incomodo para ustedes a, a salir con los, los niños. Pero what about the people who had their kids in the school and couldn't do their activities? And then they got all these freaking railroads coming up in here and these randos coming in here. Like seeing uh, background checks like nobody knows. You know what I'm saying? Like who these people are. You don't know if you got sex offenders just walking right into school with your kids. Wow. Okay. Will only be staying here tonight. The DOE says they will be out of the high school um, before school starts tomorrow. However, the DOE says that at the request of the principal, the high school will go remote on Wednesday. As many of you have heard, uh, the City Hall just put out a statement that this evening we will be evacuating for the night uh, the families with children that are out of Floyd Bennett Field. We are doing this out of an abundance of caution because of the high winds. Now, a number of parents showed up here to the school. They didn't want to talk to us on camera. Off camera, they tell us that they are angry, very upset. They were never notified about what was happening here. They tell us they called the school, and that's when they confirmed that, yes, indeed, migrants were going to be coming here to the high school. They're just upset because they say, how can it be that they are telling you, telling us, the news media, that no migrants would be going into the building until the school, uh, the children were dismissed, but we did see some of the families who arrived here on their own already go inside. And I also want to tell you guys and point out that right now, uh, a lot of police here, there is a lot of police here, a lot of also private security here, and we start, uh, we're starting to see barricades um, going up. So we do expect parents to show up around six o'clock. I was told Bro, they're that they private security as the migrants are coming off the buses. That's the latest we have here from- They got private I'm security, y'all. Fox 5 News, Natasha. Coretta could never know. <laughs> did Coretta and them get police escorts? Did, did Malcolm and them, Ma Martin and them get police? Okay, I'm just trying to see. I'm trying to see something. <laughs> Bruh, the dollars and the 
uh, the way the, the flexing of the laws on our backs right now is crazy. All right. Man, they pull something like this in Chicago, baby. It's going down. Pull this. Pull this. Pull this on the south side. I'm just saying. See what happened. <laughs> wow. Ain't no, because ain't no south side parents going. Like, I didn't draw the kids all the way up here and y'all throwing them out to school with some randos walking in here. And didn't even talk to me? Like, wow. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. See, they can go to your school. They can go to your kid's school. They can go to your kid's school. They can go everywhere except the politician's house. Okay. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. All right. Here we go. And then, and then, and then. Uh, is it okay? Mm -mm 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 -mm. So I had some other stuff here, but I want to say that for another time because I really wanted to read into that more. Oh, so let's go back to his silly little lawsuit, which I think has no legs to stand on. <laughs> no legs. He ain't got no legs. He ain't got no legs. Uh, donde fue? Oh, it was in this one, I think. And then, like, I saw it on the other page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you little tengo. I think there's something in my teeth. Let me get that out. Maybe in. All right. The New York State Senate. Legislation, section 149, penalty. So now anytime you're looking at the law, generally you want to look at like where in the law you are, like what section you're in, what title it is, like what is the the precursor to these articles. Like, what are we talking about, right? And so this section 149 is the penalty for bringing a needy person into the state, and it's under the Social Services, SOS Chapter 55, Article 5, Title 1. So you always have to remember that what a judge is going to see, especially when you're talking about on appeals and stuff like that, they are going to look at the whole of this law. So if there is any way that you can say that this is being misinterpreted, to either penalize uh free free market um or uh you know free enterprise or even movement because honestly it's, it doesn't have any legs to stand on Be, like like greg abbott said those people chose to come to those cities they chose to cross the border and then they chose to ask to come to your city and you advertise you could take care of them so who fault is that right so when you look at the facts of how it laid out it's very evident that you have no legs to stand on when i'm looking at this law that you're trying to spin and we're looking at it's under social services right like that first of all is to me is already going to be written in regard to citizens this law does not, I'm nowhere seeing any conveyance of like people that are non-citizens, but we can go look outside of it after we look at it. So here we're going to look very closely and then like see if I can zoom out and see what's going on. So 149 penalty for bringing a needy person into the state, person into the state. Any person who knowingly brings or causes to be brought a needy person from out of the state into this state for the purpose of making him a public charge shall be charged Shall, excuse me, shall be guilty of a misdemeanor punishable by a fine of $100 and shall be obligated to convey such person out of the state or support or to support him at his own expense. First of all, we already done right there because the wording of it, y'all twisted it in the way y'all are suing them. Talking about they also, now remember I just read their press release on this and they're spinning it his um, deputy mayor and whoever sheena and the other chick they're whatever quote they're spinning this because i'm gonna read it again penalty for bringing a person a needy person into the state one any person who knowingly brings or causes to be brought a needy person from out of the state we can break that down right here by interpretation a needy knowingly brings a needy person well how do i know that they're still needy if the state of new york or if the right to shelter laws or any sanctuary city or mayor or any representative of that city official in the capacity to deem so that these people can be cared for and makes a public statement that these people will be cared 
care, cared for. Why then, how are they, you know, explain to me then, how are they knowingly bringing or causing to be brought a needy person? That person is no longer needy because the, at their destination awaits the help that they seek, according to you. So how can you then turn around and sue this person? Bro, Lawyer, that lawyer gonna get them out of this so easy. From out of, <laughs> like what? From out of the state into this state for the purpose of making him a public charge shall be guilty of a misdemeanor punishable by a fine of $100. So y'all suing him for 700 million. Where does this come in at? And shall be obligated to convey such person out of the state or to support him at his own expense. So I'm done already off top. Like if y'all said y'all were going to do all this, why am I knowingly doing this? Because the public charge is you asked for it. <laughs> like what? <laughs> <laughs> you, you said you was cool with the public charge. What you want me to do now? You confusing me. The commissioner of public welfare of the district two, excuse me, the commissioner of the public welfare of the district to which such needy person is brought may, may, they said required, didn't they? Mm, mm, mm. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I want the sad by sass. Can I do that? Let me see some. Okay, so. Okay. Thought I saw them say, like, require. You guys just made that up. I'm gonna check it though. I'm gonna check it though. The court shall require satisfactory security from that person that he will convey the needy person out of state within the fixed time by the court or will indemnify Right, will convey the needy person out of the state within the time fixed by the court or will indemnify. So you're basically telling the buses, come pick all these people up and take them back. Right? Because they have that, that is their remedy. So that is the bus company's other remedy. It's written right here. The bus company can be like, yo, or the court can say, you know what, bus company, we'll agree to drop this if you just take these people back. <laughs> If such person refuses to give security when so required, the court may commit him to jail. Right. That's the part of it to get you locked up saying you're not going to take him back. Fine. We'll take him back to Texas. And now what? <laughs> like, you really going to do that? I don't think so. <laughs> you are so desperate in New York City. It is showing. Oh, not that I was reading that and it wasn't showing the page. Turn the page. Turn the page. All right. So, yeah, um, as I was sitting here reading to myself. Um, so, yeah, penalty uh, for bringing a needy person. He will convey the needy person out of the state within the time fixed by the court or will indemnify the public welfare district for all charges and expenses incurred for the assistance and care for the transportation of such needy person. And blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, it's like literally the companies could just remedy this by being like, yo, okay, cool. We'll get them out of state and we'll pay like, right? So the court shall satisfy or will indemnify the public welfare district for all charges. Expenses incurred for this is insecure for transportation of such a person. Yeah. So it sounds like this is more just like getting people from point A to point B on some other stuff. Um, like where like you just abandon somebody. <laughs> so let me just see. General provision so penalty for unlawfully bringing a needy person into a public welfare district. So let's go back to section one forty nine. Penalty for unlawfully bringing a needy person into a public welfare district. One forty eight. Uh, penalty for unlawfully bringing, okay, I said that no person shall without legal authority send or bring or cause to be sent or brought any needy person into a public welfare district with the purpose of making him a charge on such public wel welfare, welfare district or for the purpose of avoiding the responsibility of assistance or care in the public welfare district, district, excuse me, from which he is brought or sent. Any person found guilty of such an act shall be guilty of a misdemeanor and liable for to a fine of $50 recoverable in the name of the pu public welfare district. So why did y'all overlook 148? Penalty for unlawfully bringing a needy person into a public welfare district. And then the other one, public charge. So I guess 
what is the difference between a public welfare district and a public charge is the question, right? So I'm reading again, no authority with, okay, I'm sorry, no person without legal authority, no person shall, excuse me, without legal authority send or bring or cause to be sent or brought any needy person into a public welfare district with the purpose of making him a public charge on such public welfare district or for the purpose of avoiding the responsibility of assistance or care in the public welfare district from which he is brought or sent any person found guilty of such an act shall be guilty of a misdemeanor and liable to a fine of fifty dollars recoverable in the name of the public welfare district so yeah i i'm trying to see like what is the difference bringing a needy person into the state bring an ED person into a public welfare district. Sounds like it's giving like state versus public welfare district. Just any lo lo like locale. I would have to see what their definition of public welfare district is on the books if it is there. Uh, let's see, general provisions just go all the way up here. Assistance and care. So let's just see what this whole chapter is about. Assistance and care services to be given, monthly grants, allowance of public assistance. So this is their, this is pretty much their state public policy. <laughs> Availability of average childhood, um, public aid policy, excuse me. Uh, Availability of average childhood experiences, services, fees for services, family homelessness, eviction prevention, supplemental program, inclusion of parents and siblings of a minor, substance abuse, rehabilitative preventive services planning family planning excuse me retroactive social security benefit increases authority to accept public and private gifts authority to operate family homes for adults social services districts agreements family loan programs certain utility deposits so this is oh here we go we finally have a section about undocumented non-citizens so that means that for some reason they are separate than everyone else Let's see what it says. What we're we talking about here. <laughs> Did they skip this one? Let's read this aloud. Section 131K, Undocumented Non Citizens, Social Services, Chapter 55, Article 5, Title 1. 131K dash K undocumented sit non citizens and otherwise eligible applicant or recipient who has been determined to be ineligible for a to dependent children home relief or medical assistance because an individual is a non citizen unlawfully residing in the United States or because such individual failed to furnish evidence that such individual is lawfully residing in the United States shall be immediately referred to the United States Immigration and Nationalization Service or the nearest consulate of the country of the applicant or the recipient for such service or consulate to take appropriate action or or furnish assistance an otherwise eligible applicant or recipient who has been determined to be ineligible for a two dependent children home relief or medical assistance because such individual is a non citizen unlawfully residing in the United States or because such individual failed to furnish evidence that such individual is lawfully residing in the United States shall be immediately referred to the United States Immigration and Naturalization Services or the nearest consulate of the country of the applicant or the recipient for such service or consulate to take appropriate action, whatever that might be, or furnish assistance skipped clean over that is there something there that's questionable here someone who would otherwise be eligible for benefits meaning they don't have the income to sustain themselves by poverty levels they're eligible by whatever other circumstances meaning they you know meet those minimum requirements they're eligible that individual is required to provide proof that they're a citizen and if they are not or cannot do such, they will be immediately referred to the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service. That's INS. That's ICE. 
<laughs> that's INS, which is of a branch of ICE, right? Or the head or whatever of ICE. Or the nearest consulate of the country, the applicant or recipient for such service or consulate to take appropriate. The nearest consulate of the country of the applicant. So they need to be told to refer back to Venezuela or or whoever, right? Or the federal government who said, oh, it's cool. Go to New York, come across the border, da 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 da, da. This is in y'all same title. <laughs> right? This is in your social services SOS chapter 55, article 5, title 1. And then you skipped clean over that. Right? To say, oh, here we are. Here's my out. Never mind all that stuff. Because, like, we set undocumented peoples apart because we know they have a different circumstance in that situation. But then now you're going to, like, be like, nah, but they still talking about them right here, way down here at this random section that gives no other inference that we're talking about a random situation in which the borders are just wide open. <laughs> See, see how far down that is from undocumented non-citizen. Do you see how far we had to go? <laughs> They're not even touching. Okay. Um, and then before it, we've got it's sandwiched between misuse of food stamps. So this sounds like people who qualified. <laughs> it's sandwiched in between misuse of food stamps and penalty for neglect or a report or for making a false report. Mm hmm. Maybe y'all should read a little further and see what's going on with y'all. <laughs> this lawsuit sounds a little frivolous. Right? Penalties for cash and public assistance checks or accepting electronic benefit transfers from public assistance recipients. So that's like the fraud, right? Fraud. And then here we are, this standing kind of alone penalty for bringing a needy person into the state. We have to know the intent of this law. And this law sounds like trying to stop people from trafficking people across state lines, trying to get aid for them. That's what this sounds like this was written for, to stop somebody from bringing somebody into the state knowingly just to, so they can go get benefits there in that state. Because why would you take them from one state to another day if they qualify in Ohio Right. And it's saying state to state like it literally. Well, it does say state to state, but bringing a needy person into the state. But we're still talking state level, like nowhere is it saying out of the country or non-citizen or undocumented or a legal immigrant or asylum seeker like this policy to me is referring to. Two citizens, but okay, needy person. Person means a person, right? Bringing a so it's very open there, but it's here. I feel like is where y'all lose knowingly brings or causes to be brought a needy per person when y'all said no, it's cool, we got it. We're welcoming city, welcome. <laughs> you can't say welcome and then turn it around and sue the person that came in. <laughs> for coming in needing something you knew they already needed <laughs> that you said you had <laughs> you or you was getting you was working on it but joe byron <laughs> joe byron he not helping you <laughs> what's up joe take me to dinner where he at <laughs> joe everybody want dinner <laughs> where you at joe all right, so I'm just saying, if you look at where this is in the policy, it's very much giving that he is he's reaching the their law department. It looks like is scrambling. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm done with that. Okay. <laughs> there you have it. And then uh, let's see. Yeah. And so again, he's saying that the migrants are being like traffic the best christmas gift for a car owner in 2023 my wife overdid herself like, are they she being solved my problems there, with low sir? tire pressure and flat tire You're there's nothing more stressful than having a flat tire it? not only that but what if you have a flat tire in the middle of nowhere where you don't have an option to have air 
As the suburbs oh, continue yeah, to take yeah. a stand on arriving migrants, the city is. As the suburbs continue to take a stand on arriving migrants, the city is running. Um, this is cuál es. I guess. Out of funds to help them and space to house them. But as our Maribel Gonzalez reports tonight, they are still choosing Chicago as their oh, okay. landing spot in the U.S. Maribel? Yeah, that's right, Joe. Even as temperatures drop, Chicago continues to be a hot spot for new arrivals. We spoke to someone running some of the shelters along the border who shed some light as to why this is happening. What we're saying. I see what you did there, Maribel. She said that even though it's cold with the falling temperatures, they're choosing Chicago as a hot spot. Yes, yes. And is that it is fluctuating greatly from day to day. Before asylum seekers get to Chicago, they arrive at border cities like El Paso. John Martin, who helps run a network of shelters there, is there to meet them. A typical stay for us is typically between two to three days. We work with them to get them to their destination of choice, which varies. Martin says migrants are choosing to go to cities all over the country, but the top destinations continue to be Denver, New York City, and Chicago. We know it's getting, it's cold here. Is John Martin a racist? <laughs> <laughs> for giving the migrants what they want. Hmm? Is John Martin a racist? Is he trafficking migrants? Hmm? Is he creating a public charge? Hmm? Is he doing that? Are you all suing John at whatever his organization is? Are you doing that? Hmm. Interesting thoughts here to have. Here in Chicago, and it's only getting colder. Why do you believe people are still choosing Chicago as their destination. I think the predominant issue is that whether it be, and in your case, probably unintentional, is that they now have a support network within Chicago. Support network being others that have preceded them at that point. Meaning family and friends who have come to Chicago and are now established here. The city has received over 26,000 migrants since last August. Mayor Brandon Johnson warning space is running out and now we're learning so are the funds. Local municipalities are not structured um, to be able to carry the weight of, of a crisis like this. We've Whoa, whoa, whoa. So Texas, I guess because Texas is a state, maybe someone needs to break it down for him. Let me see. Let me see if I can pull this up for him once again. Once again. Are you watching, Brandon? East Texas? Does Texas have cities? <laughs> Look it. Texas has cities. Okay, let's try this one. Does Texas have cities on the border? <laughs> the main U.S.-Mexican border crossings along the Texas border are... Oh, look. Hay tantos. <laughs> El Paso, Ciudad Juárez, Chihuahua, excuse me, Laredo, Texas, Nuevo Laredo, Tamal, oh my God, these are matándome, Tamaulipas, 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 okay. McAllen, Texas, and Reynosa, Tamaulipas. Oh, they're telling the, the Mexico City right on the side, like parallel to the... um. The, t the border town. Let me see. <laughs> what cities on the Texas border? Hay tantos, mira. Look at this. Brownsville and Matamores, McAllen, Reynosa, Rio Grande City, and cities Miguel Alamán, Camargo, Laredo, Nuevo Laredo, Eagle Pass, Piedras Negras, De Rio, y Ciudad Acuña, Presidio, y Ojinaga, y El Paso, y Ciudad Juárez. Mira. Mira eso. Mira eso. Come on, Brandon. You ain't looked at a map of Texas. Local municipalities are in Texas too, my friend. Buddy, buddy. They got local municipalities over there too. Hold on. Let me see. Let me see if I can. I think you a visual. I think you a visual guy. <laughs> can you see that, Brandon? <laughs> That's Texas, right? This is Texas. Right here, that is that state there that you so angry at. But if you would look beyond those mere letters, <laughs> 
you will see this line of delineation here. And this is what we call la frontera or the border. And this here is the U.S. side in the amarillo, the yellow. And then in the green, we have verde, which is Mexico. Okay. Y mira cómo esa funciona. Okay. El de ciudades acá, en la frontera, you have ciudad. El paso, mira, es en Texas. It's a city local to Texas because it's in Texas. So guess what? Governor Abbott, who runs Texas, has the authority to help this city, a local municipality like you, to figure out how to deal with their frontera crisis which they were fronteando all this time solitos sin tu ayuda sin su fanfarron right you didn't have anything to say then while they were struggling pero you want toda la atención en tu you want toda la atención en ti porque están en las noticias right están en la televisión hablándose como un pinche okay I don't want to curse them out but he's very, uh, un poquito lento, okay? <laughs> okay, muy amable. Okay, y you want to get on here and cry, but where are the tears for El Paso? Where are the tears for Presidio? Where are the tears for the Rio, Rio Pass, Laredo, and lo demás? ¿Dónde están esos llantos, huh? Why? Why nobody crying for them? Huh? Don't cry for me, Chicago. The truth is, I'll send more buses. <laughs> ¿Qué es eso? Learned Chicago is using $95 million of COVID relief funds to foot the bill for migrant expenses instead. And Ridiculo. now mayors across the country, including ours, are calling on the federal government to help. To help. In El to Paso, stop Martin ruining your lives. New arrivals about <laughs> conditions and destinations like Chicago. Even posting this at their shelters, our Media. daily overnight temperatures to give them a visual of what to expect. And then we relay to them. Did y'all see that? This is what I wanted to show y'all the last time, but I guess I forgot to link the clip. Them, based upon... Mira, mira, mira. Mira, what does that look like? Temperatures buddy, to give them does a... that look like Buddy in Texas forcing anything on you, sir? Look at that. They gave them photos. Hay, hay manera para elegir lo que está hablando a su alma, no? You're giving them visuals, clima, okay? Y usted en la noticia de la televisión como una comercial, la advertencia, diciéndoles a todo el mundo que bienvenido acá porque tenemos todo. Vamos a poner un poquito de monedas aquí, mover a, a poquito de allí, a mover a la gente. Está bien para, para estarse cómodo, ¿no? <ríe> para ponerse cómodo, todo bien. Váyase. Pero vamos a agarrar todo el dinero y usted tiene que esperar un trabajo, salud de mental, salud física, lo que necesita. Tiene que esperar, pero ya gastamos todo el dinero en esas cosas para ustedes, pero tiene que esperar como lo demás, como lo demás, como, como nuestros, uh, uh, los, ¿cómo se dice? Los constituentes, right? For our people, they're waiting, so you can wait a little too, right? Espérase, pero todo bien. Pero we're going to get on Buddy on Texas. We're suing people. We got it. We got it, okay? <sighs> Oh, you still don't got a job. Oh, one percent of you have work permits. Oh my God! But you got to get out the shelter. But we care. We care. We care. We're here to help the churches. They're helping oh, churches, churches. <laughs> Visual of what to expect when they're in the back counting money. Sometimes they get a little occupied. I mean, praying. <laughs> Act. And then we relay to them based upon what we've seen within the media, that there may not be shelter or any type of capacity within the community. But again, it's a decision that they make.
Mm-hmm. Now we know that these buses chartered by the state of Texas are dropping off migrants in the suburbs as a way of skirting around city protocols. The suburb of Elmhurst over the last week has received seven buses. The mayor there telling us that all, everyone except a handful of the passengers were sent here to Chicago. Reporting live in the newsroom, Maribel Gonzalez, CBS 2 News. Maribel, thank you. So you want to take away their free choice by suing bus companies, by telling them that they're they can't come at any time of night. They have to talk to you first. They have to come at a certain time during the day at a certain location. For they the have to do very specific the- things to meet your demands so that then they they can then get all this help that you told them about. <laughs> they're coming here sick. They're coming on buses. <laughs> They're coming here poor. <laughs> Who could have thought of this? The product. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Help. <laughs> but don't say Biden. Joe Byron, we gotta go to dinner. Take me to dinner. Let me see if I can find that. <laughs> What do you want to tell Joe Byron right now? What's up, baby? Take me out to dinner. Hey, yo. What do you want to tell Joe Byron right now? What's up, baby? Take me out to dinner. Hey. We're all waiting. We're all waiting. Like half of South America. (laughs) The rest of us. We're all waiting on Joe to take us to dinner. (laughs) Wait your turn, guy. (laughs) Or jump the line. (laughs) It's America. Take me out to dinner, Joe. All right. And so, yeah, migrants chose Chicago because they already have a network. This is the problem that you created for yourself. And now you are crying and you just need to shut the F up and be a big boy. Okay, Brandon and Eric and anyone else who wants to throw a tantrum and try to threaten free enterprise by throwing around frivolous frivolous lawsuits that you know don't have a freaking chance in hell, wasting, further wasting taxpayer dollars, okay, to pursue this, when you could just do what the fuck you were bragging about you were going to do, which was acquire the funds necessary to make sure that these people have a smooth transition into integrating into your city so you can get them to work for cheap labor, right? Um, Flashback. It makes sense that no great nation can be in a position where they can't control their borders. It matters. Whoa, what? What? That makes sense? Hold on, hold on. He said that? Like, wait, one second. I just want to make sure I'm not that hearing things. No great nation can be in a position where they can't control their borders. It matters how you control your borders. Not just for immigration, but it matters for drugs, terror, a whole range of other things. So. That's the first sort of truism. The second truism is that, that this nation is such that people in the country should have the first opportunity to be able to have jobs that pay well. And a few years later. This exclusive video, migrants illegally crossing into the U.S. through a right through a gap in the border wall in uh, Luckville, Arizona. At one point, you could even see a suspected smuggler <laughs> poke through the wall and pull out a camera. He had this comes sentence. just that days his- after the Biden administration reopened the legal port of entry in uh, Lukeville. From <laughs> days after the suspected <laughs> smuggler poked through the wall and pull out a camera. This comes just days after the Biden administration reopened the legal port of entry in uh, Lukeville. From all parts of the political spectrum. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Not this dude taking the Uber, your Uber has been delivered (laughs) photo. Your Instacart order is on your porch. (laughs) He literally did the Amazon verification photo of I... (laughs) <laughs> did the convoy i, I bust these people here <laughs> like <laughs> oh my god it's ridiculous reopen the legal port of entry in uh lukeville from all parts of the political spectrum one of the biggest issues that we have when it comes to immigration is the fact that we have an undocumented population mm-hmm. now you can fix that by trying to build a wall 
or you can fix that by trying to document people and create a path to citizenship. Oh yeah, oh yeah, you're talking girl. Get it girl. <laughs> and um, we'll have folks that might say, look at these systems, you know that our shelter system has weight and things like that. But one of the reasons that our public systems experience weight is because people don't have a documented and reliable path to work and sustain themselves, mm -hmm. just like all of our ancestors did and our, and our grandparents and great grandparents. All right, guys. Bro, ancestors ain't grandparents and great grandparents. She's just saying shit. Anyway, um, <laughs> oh dear AOC, did you just admit the great replacement theory? <laughs> Our shelters are gonna be burdened and overwhelmed. Yeah, because you're sending the migrants to the black neighborhoods where you already have, you know, decided that you don't care about us and have left us to die. And then, <laughs> and then you bring in these migrants, right? And you want to make a pathway to citizenship for them, of course, because guess what that eventually does? Citizenship. <gasps> you can vote. Oh my God. Oh, but we can't say that part, can we? Oh, but she just did. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Convenient. And then we get them to work because they get to take lower wages in those black neighborhoods where you have these unfulfilled positions or that you don't want to pay the full, you know, uh, minimum wage, or you just simply just want to have another population that you can control for votes or, you know, kickbacks or God knows what else. But hey, I'm just theorizing here. I mean, you would never, Mr. Progressive Mayor, you love us too much, our black mayor. I, so on this episode of <laughs> so uh this was another podcast that i found i'm not going to play this whole thing but uh this obviously on this little interview buddy buddy going uh e crying and stuff so i'm let's see if i can pull that up uh mm, mm, mm. Ciao. just ridiculous but did y'all see that? Did y'all see that graph at the beginning uh, of uh, whose policies? I just want to make sure y'all saw that too. Illegal immigrant encounters. So you've got, let's see, can I make this bigger? Just so y'all can see that better. I just want to make sure y'all can see that. Bruh, do you see that? That is Obama. Five million, Trump a little under five million, and your boy, your boy Joe, sleepy Joe, sleeping at the well. <laughs> okay, twelve million. <laughs> he want to tell us ain't nothing there, friend. Okay, <laughs> it's coming out, baby. We can see, baby. We can see. <laughs> okay, we can see, baby. We can see. Anywho. So let me um, pull up. Uh, no. So let's uh, pull up this crap. Let's see, was this the one? No. The banner says Exodus from Poverty. This column of humanity heading north from the countries of Central and South America and well beyond too. North to the United States because they think the opportunity, the hope is there. We are looking to improve ourselves, to have a better quality of life, because in our country, the situation is getting worse and worse, and we are only looking for an opportunity. What we are looking for is to work. We are not criminals. We are not bad people. There is nothing new about all this. The number of people crossing illegally into America this past year has been staggering. 10,000 a day last week, and nearly a quarter of a million encountered by the US border officials in November. It has been a record-breaking year, and objectively, it seems clear that the U.S. government has lost any sense of control. It's why the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, landed in Mexico late this holiday week. President Biden sent him to find a deal to fix the problem.
because he knows that the border issue may well cost him the White House. There was, we're told, some progress, and it is familiar stuff, tackling the smugglers, repatriating people, more money. None of it, though, has worked before. And so while the politicians spoke of solutions along the border fence, the people continue to gather. This is a part of the U.S. southern border where former President Trump's wall has been built. But as Sky News has seen this past year, the controversial fence doesn't stretch the length of the border, not nearly. And so, of course, those who are pushed from poverty and pulled to hope will continue to come and pass. Remember, Donald Trump is the Republican Party's frontrunner for president this coming year. And so images like these are a gift for him. This is the tarmac in the northeastern U.S. city of Philadelphia, and it is a neat hint of America's complex migrant puzzle. The plane is full of those seeking a new life, chartered to shift them away from Texas to become another state's problem. And in New York, further north, a familiar sight. Buses arriving from Texas as they have been almost daily all year, a 36-hour drive. 14 of these arrived in one night this week. 7,200 people into the city in just two weeks, all of it a record. It is, of course, an age-old challenge about fears and hopes, pushing and pulling. But here, now, it is impacting the direction of a U.S. election which could reshape the world. Mark Stone, Sky News in Washington. There so, is how I got um, shredded in just 10. So disrespectful. All right. So, yes, you have 8,000 migrants in a caravan, like regularly. They're getting 10,000 a day crossings, like regularly. And they said they could not handle that ever. And that is their new reality. Um, and so you can keep pretending you don't know it's Joe Biden, but I mean, everything, everything is there. Uh, this chick was pissing me off. I just want you to hear like what happens when someone turns up at the border. That's a good one. Why are we seeing historic levels of people? Okay. So let's just look at this real quick. Rebecca, why are we seeing these historic levels of num of people trying to get into the United States now? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. And, and your previous, um, at, the, at the top of this report, you, you, your reporter sort of alluded to some of them. You know, there are a lot of people who are coming and hearing rumors about the political situation in the United States as we enter an election year and as we hear uh, various um, you know, people who are running for president to, to talking about migrants as though they're political pawns. And so people are afraid that there are going to be even more draconian um, policies put in place at our southern border and so are, are feeling a renewed sense of urgency, which is probably um, at least contributing to, to the increased numbers of, of people uh, crossing and attempting to cross um, in, in the previous month. Leon, um, Rebecca says more draconian policies put in, may be put in place in the future. Just talk us through what happens right now when someone turns up at the border, either undocumented, seeking asylum. What happens? What's the process? Well, the government first needs to decide whether to place them into what is something called expedited removal, which is what happens when you show up at the border without any documentation to prove that you're allowed to be in the United States. If the government puts them in expedited removal, they can literally do what those words say, expedited removal, unless you give a defense to expedited removal, which is asylum, which is that you're going to be persecuted in your home country. At that point, the person then has a burden to show that they have a fear. And depending on how they enter the United States, if it's their second time or they have some problem, they either have to show what's called a credible fear, which is a lower standard, or a reasonable fear, which is a higher standard. But in any case, a fear of persecution. And if they can establish that, then they are allowed to remain in the United States. But sometimes so many people show up at one time that they can't even do any of this. And they just let the people in uh, and tell them to check in with ICE later at a future location. And in that situation, you aren't even put into any of that burden. And so both of those things happen at the same time, because you actually need a significant amount of detention space to be able to do this first process. So depending on 
where you go and what you show up and how many people show up, you might not even get that first scrutiny, which people are sometimes saying isn't even sufficient scrutiny. Okay, Rebecca, I can see you're shaking your head there. What, what, <laughs> Rebecca why, why are you shaking your so head? What mad. do you not agree with there? Well, I think that there's sort of um, a, a, mis a fundamental misunderstanding of the way that our system works and, and sort of some, some framing that needs to be addressed. And one is this idea that people are simply let in. That is not the case. Um, no one is just let into the United States. He didn't say that, but okay. Of, um, either or both a legal process and a, a method of, of as as um, my, my colleague said, a method of checking in. We right now have a system in which people who are let in, quote unquote, um, are put on um, va various forms of surveillance, including an app that they are that are, they are instructed to use on their phone that can be tracked of where they are in the United States. Um, additionally, they are put into the system of, of removal process. So they are given um, what's called a notice to appear, and they are told that they need to come uh, to court in order to to um, uh, defend their their um, claim for uh, asylum. The, the CBP officers that encounter people at the border are required to ask under their own guidance whether or not someone fears return to their home country. That is regardless of whether the person is put in expedited removal or not. And so CBP is turning back uh, thousands of people all the time, uh, including many reports say people who are are in fact saying that they fear um, return to home country, but are being turned back anyway. And and so what we are talking about is, is a lack of resources throughout the system, not just at the border, and certainly not just for enforcement purposes, law enforcement purposes, but but resources needed at the level of asylum officers, resources needed at the level of the immigration courts. That's where we should be focused. Focusing rather than a lot of the conversation, which has been about simply preventing people from coming in the first place. OK, Maureen, what, what percentage roughly would you say of people who arrive at the border manage to show that they have credible fear and are allowed to proceed through the system? You know, that's um, an interesting question, because in part, how many people are able to access protection in the United States and get asylum is also due to how many get access to legal counsel. As was highlighted, that can be very difficult, especially if you have a, a quick mm -hmm. hearing, but also there's um, not enough lawyers right now to support the number of asylum seekers in the United States. I think the recent numbers, I want to say a little bit under half of the people mm. are gaining access to protection. But that means that all of those people, if they had been quickly sent home, without the chance to seek protection, could be sent back to torture, death, half. other forms of persecution. She and said so about the, half the idea after she did all that should be erring on the side deflect. of protection, that these are people in need and not trying to deter people or to simply send them back. And I wanted to highlight, I think, what, what Rebecca said about what's happening at the border. A lot of these people are crossing so far in the remote parts of the border because the Biden administration has tried to channel people through the ports of entry through CBP-1 app which is an app mm. that you can you need to use to get an appointment. But, the but they don't want to follow that rule. 450 appointments a day. It is a very tricky app. It's only available in three languages. Um, and there is simply not enough appointments for the number of people that need to request asylum. And so they're, they're being, they feel like they're forced after sometimes months of waiting. It can take seven months, eight months to actually get an appointment. They're desperate. And that's why you also see people crossing in between the ports of entry and in these remote areas, because simply meant they, there aren't enough appointments available and there's not enough infrastructure at the ports to be receiving the number of people that would like to enter every day and request protection. Who would like Leon, to, to enter every day? Who would like to situation versus could be who need to have to asylum more resources for their life? into the system, more border patrol, more immigration judges, more money, more people, more personnel to process people in a faster way because there is a fear as well isn't there from certain segments of the u.s that if you make the process easier and faster they're simply going to encourage more people to come i think there's two different questions so one question is how can you make the system to render an adjudication as quickly as possible more efficient? And that answer is all of the resources. A second question is, do we want the system to continue in the way it's operating today? And so that's the political debate that's happening today. Mm -hmm. There's, I think, 
half of the Congress probably would reject the premise. And I'm not giving a personal opinion. I'm just trying sure. to lay out the facts. Half of the Congress would probably reject the opinion that more resources to expedite the admission of more people into the United States to allow them to wait in the United States while their case is pending is desirable. They don't want that. They want people excluded from the United States until such time as they can establish their claim. And some people don't even want them to be able to ever establish an asylum claim. So that's the, the sort of furthest extreme. And then I think you're hearing a position uh, that's at, at the other end, which is, look, if we just can get people in as quickly as possible and process them, then that's the solution to the problem. Well, that's the solution to the problem of backlogs, but it's not the solution to the problem of, are you trying to have immigration curtailed in some number? And so that's, it just depends what problem you're trying to solve for. Rebecca, it seems that the Biden administration is currently focusing on the deterrent solution or what it considers to be the solution. We've right. just had Secretary of State Blinken the in Biden, Mexico requesting that Mexico do more to stop people reaching the U.S.-Mexico border. What do you make of that? Well, I think that, you know, um, recent and, and distant history has shown that deterrence does not work. Um, I, I think that there's it's important for, for your audience to understand that the U.S. has an obligation under its own laws to allow people to seek asylum in the United States. Mm -hmm. People's opinions she or like political that. positions in Congress can't usurp that obligation. And it's not just under uh, U.S. law, but it's also under international law. And so sort of but what about well, the half? We can talk about the, the politics of it. We need to understand that that underlying um, uh, premise is that people have a right to seek asylum in the United States if they have uh, the basis for it. And so then the, the real only question is, is how do we the assess that um, appropriately and humanely um, assess people's people's claims for asylum um, in terms of uh, President Biden's um, current sort of objective to get the Mexican government more involved. You know, we were just on a delegation uh, to various points along the border and also inside Mexico and talked to dozens of, of migrants who are in exactly the situation that Maureen described of waiting on that side for those appointments. And we we know, not just anecdotally from, from our experience, but from other reporting, other human rights organizations, that those deterrence um, policies <clears throat> are, first of all, currently already in place. The Mexican government and Mexican police across Mexico, so through the entire area of Mexico, are turning back migrants, forcing them into other areas of Mexico and, and, and attempting to keep them out of Mexico yeah, altogether. Okay. Even people who have appointments or other permission to come into the United States already. So the idea that we would rely on the Mexican government and Mexican um, law enforcement to enforce those policies should be concerning to anyone who cares about human rights. But it's also important to, to understand, again, that this is not simply about whether whether or not we can keep people out or in, it's about a, a, um, a process of allowing people and, and, and um, assessing mm. whether or not people can come in, at, at, um, in in a way that allows our system in the United States to work. Mm. But the trouble is, it, is that this is a big li political liability for Biden, isn't it? I mean, Maureen, we've got an election year. We've got Again, Republican pressure in Congress. How much more can Biden withstand these numbers without being seen to do something? I mean, I think that was part of the, the, the visit that, that we saw yesterday of Secretary Blinken and Mallorca to Mexico was trying to show that they are working to address the issue. That was also part of the budget request. The, the debate isn't just how do we unfortunately lower the bar for asylum, but also in that budget packet was additional resources for more agents at the borders and more, more resources to address what's happening. I think it is a political um, liability. It's very difficult right now for the Biden administration. Republicans have continuously used the border and immigration as, as, as a weapon in, in political campaigns. They don't have to we now. We're seeing several Democrat-led local governments also pushing. They don't have to now. Y'all made the border y'all own weapons. So, I mean, so, yeah, they talk about, like, long-term solutions, uh, response to federal facility solution. Let's see the most replayed. 
people to help themselves? So I think two things here. One, it's also um, we cannot be locking up families with children. And I think that is also there are legal restrictions on how many families could be held in detention for only three weeks. And there's a lot of really effective alternatives to detention systems that are more cost effective that really will make sure people um, show up in court. I think if you are an asylum seeker facing um, your asylum proceedings outside of detention, because there are some that are in detention, which is extremely complicated for them to have legal representation and to go through their cases. But if you are one that is outside of detention, you have six months after you um, submit your, your asylum request where you have to wait for work authorization. And this is one of the biggest challenges currently that we're facing in these communities where you have high numbers of asylum seekers, such as New York, Washington, Chicago, and elsewhere, is that those people can't work legally until they have that authorization. And so they're basically depending on social services, volunteers, people that are housing asylum seekers, including in, in different cities, and also working um, irregularly. And so I think there is that big challenge. This is something Congress she said has irregu to change, though, not the She said working irregularly, not illegally. <laughs> after six months to work. The other important part, and I think what Leon said is true, a lot of these individuals are arriving in the United States without the family ties and social networks that we've seen in other waves of, of migrants, and that it is taxing the system more. But you hear time and time again from these asylum seekers, they just want to come and they want to work. And mm -hmm. I think that is one of the biggest challenges is how do you speed up that ability for them to legally work and sustain themselves so they're not also a burden on the system. Leon, this is a political issue. Lawmakers, politicians have made it so. I'm interested to know, what do Americans feel about cross-border migrants? Broadly speaking, are they in favor or against people coming to the United States? I mean, this is the, the country is divided on this issue. And I think it also depends on if you look at it macro or micro, meaning on the macro level, probably you have, you know, half the country is appalled that the border is in the shape that it's in right now. And then another group will be of the, you know, of the mindset that it can be managed or fixed. And then on the micro level, you also will have people who say, well, this particular person is fine. It's the rest of them that are not fine. And so there's always these huge incongruences. But just generally, now I cannot speak for all of America. I would just say you can't run an immigration system that disincentivizes legal immigration and incentivizes uh uh, irregular migration, meaning just show up and, and come. I mean, this, this is the problem. The Biden administration tried with the CBP-1 app, with the asylum changes to the regulations, and all of that was, was, was helpful in mm. steering. But the problem is people get impatient, as was described here, and they say, I won't wait six, seven months for the CBP app appointment. I want to arrive right now into the United States. And I understand sometimes the, 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 the circumstances warrant it, but nevertheless, you have to have a situation where that's, that's not made in such a sufficient manner, in such an easy manner, where people know if they can just tough it up for a few weeks, they'll be allowed into the interior of the United States, because that does encourage more migration. It just... It's, it's, it's a complicated situation. And okay, so it is, it is a complicated situation. And apologies that we do have Dan, to leave it there. Dan, cut him off. He was like, now she tried to end on that. Uh, Leon and she Rebecca pissed. and Maureen. Not oh, girl with the agenda, uh, pissed. Reply to she mad. Look at her. She like, I had an agenda and I was not able to deliver. You let him get the final word. <laughs> you know we paid you for that. <laughs> Uh, I kid, I kid. Why would she ever? Why would she ever? All right. So uh, there's a lot. There's so much. And I'm already good, 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 good into this. But uh, let's see. We got um, groups of men from Africa. Oh, yeah. Let's see what this was. What was the process of that? Uh, President Biden's Justice Department is suing, as you know, the state of Texas over its new border security.
Hold on, Dressed in jean shorts and tube winter. socks, this new arrival is shivering as he and others are getting a good taste of a Chicago winter. There are about 280 migrants at the city's landing zone, packed into warming buses, waiting for shelter as the cold rain pours down. Of course, it's not ideal. I don't think they were meant to be a, a permanent solution. Um, the city I know is struggling to find uh, available beds. And Andre Gordillo's organization, New Life Centers, is assisting the city in welcoming the new arrivals. They are all given a coat, warm clothing, and a blanket, but nothing more. For now, as, as they wait and, uh, for beds to open up, we can't be providing three jackets and, and four blankets because storage becomes an issue. And there is no spare room on the buses. Jose Angel Farias has been living on one for three days. He's worried about the health of his two-year-old daughter. Farias says there are some people on the buses with fevers. He says, we do not have the means for a medical emergency. The buses are super crowded. There is not room for one more person. Faria says sleeping at night on the bus is almost impossible. Families, specifically single women and children, are the first to be placed in a shelter. Single men are the last. Some have been living at the landing zone for several days. 21-year-old Andres Cusayo says, Although the bus is uncomfortable, at least it gives you a little warmth. The landing zone may get some relief by week's end. The long-awaited state shelter at a former Little Village CVS is scheduled to open soon. And a new shelter comes just in time for migrants to experience a Chicago winter in January. Single digits are expected early next week. Watch breaking news. On Ciao. This is a mess. You can look a little bit more into Title VIII versus Title 42, but the gist of it is that Title VIII um, basically is stating that you are... Uh, Sorry. Title eight is a standard immigration processing. It allows immigrants, I'm sorry, migrants seeking humanitarian protection to plead their case before an immigration judge or for those not eligible for admission to be pro processed for deportation. That was title eight. Title 42. Uh, excuse me. Uh, was a U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention order that pro allowed, excuse me, the Trump and Biden administration to rapidly expel migrants. Notice they said Trump and Biden were both using this policy. Rapidly expel migrants during the pandemic without being given a chance to seek asylum. Um, so once he list lifted that Title 42 due to the end of the pandemic, we went back to Title 8. But the issue is that folks are getting word of mouth and uh, that app from the president and, you know, sanctuary city, somebody, everybody welcome and the cartel and people emptying God knows if the jails or what else and sending folks and saying, go ahead, a better life waits for you there. That is what made something so normal become so abnormal that like they explain the expectation that when administrations change if trump wins which god if biden is trying to he needs to look like it <laughs> uh i heard that he doesn't want to debate it, there was something about uh he doesn't want to debate uh Trump because it's going to give him a platform for hate rhetoric or whatever. Since when do we censor the presidential debates? Um, but yeah. Without light, there's no path from this darkness. If you really care about the lives lost here, you should honor the lives lost in Baltimore, ceasefire in Palestine. Ceasefire! Yeah. 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 Ceasefire! 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 Yeah. Ceasefire!
The president's poll numbers continue to stay stagnant. A new AP poll suggests that many Democratic voters would be unsatisfied if Biden were nominated as the Democratic candidate for president, while more independent voters would be dissatisfied if Biden were nominated than Trump. Mm. Well, the polling hits keep coming. Future majority reports Trump is up six points in crucial swing state Pennsylvania, while Rasmussen reports shows large swaths of voters, nearly two-thirds of voters, see the crisis at the southern border as an invasion, a critical failure point for Biden as immigration Black continues to rate very highly as an important issue for voters. Here to discuss Biden's re-election chances and polling data is Bruh. host of the Savvy Saps podcast, Sabrina Salvati. Welcome back, Sabrina. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me on. Always great to see you. Um, first, why don't you address this dust up at the church and the complaints from some people like Simone Sanders that this was inappropriate given the setting? The nerve of Joe Biden to appear at a black church after he has reneged on the promises that he made to the black community when he ran for president Ooh. in 2020. He has some gall. Uh, this just goes to show you, if you look at the protesters that were in the audience of that church, those were younger voters. It shows you that once again, Joe Biden has not found a way to connect with young voters in this country. Most of the people in that audience are older voters, which is what you would expect if you go to a lot of the black churches mm -hmm. uh, predominantly in the South. You old Southern, uh, you know, you, you 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 make good cornbread. You know, you know, you know. It's always nice to come visit your mima, okay? But y'all need to just stop voting because y'all are out of touch. You've been out of touch because that's why we where we at now, and you continue to be out of touch. And then you want to tell us to be quiet in the church while y'all got the devil himself in the pulpit telling you lies god help you but we can't be mistaken jim clyburn is sitting there right next to joe biden uh, almost as a sidekick so to speak and jim clyburn bears the responsibility of some of this as well because he was the one that told his constituents to support joe biden in 2020 because joe biden was going to deliver for the african-american uh community uh i actually graduated from the university of south carolina but i didn't grow up in south carolina so i never really understood the admiration for someone like Jim Clyburn, people would say to me, it's because he hosts a fish fry. But you can fry <laughs> your own fish. This just goes to show you how- <laughs> ah! Sis, I wasn't ready. You ain't have to eat them up like that. You can fry your own fish. You ain't black if you can't fry your own fish. <laughs> how little we are willing to to settle for in the black community. We need to start asking these leaders, some of the black leaders, what are they doing for the community today? And Jim today. Clyburn is not doing much for the community today. His district is one of the poorest districts in the country. Meanwhile, Jim is living just fine. Mm -hmm. So I think people like him have led us down this path. They they've had us continue on the same path that we've been doing for the past couple decades, which is why we haven't received any type of progress when it comes to politics in this country. Now, in reference to Simone Sanders, we have to remember Don't Simone Sanders like was Joe Biden's senior advisor when he was running for president for 2020. Uh, she was hoping that she would get that press secretary gig that didn't pan out for her. He gave that to Jen Psaki instead. And it almost seems like they gave her an MSNBC position kind of to just quiet her uh, for, for so much of a bit. But this is Simone Sanders' job. She is still supposed to carry weight for the Democratic Party, to carry weight for Joe Biden, to defend him at all costs. And when she makes this statement that she's more concerned about the protesters that confronted Joe Biden, I'm more concerned about genocide, Simone. Right. I'm more concerned about our tax dollars being spent to fund these wars abroad. I'm more concerned about the fact that the Democratic Party, till this day, refuses to give any type of real concessions to the African-American community. Those are the things that Simone Sanders should be upset about, but she's not. She's trying to make sure she holds her spot at MSNBC. Ooh, ooh. 
I think you make a number of really important points Look there. Look at his face. About Ooh, he is shook. <laughs> Shouty is shook. He he got shook with that fish fry. Look how she looking. She like, yeah, buddy. She had, look at them corners, that mouth corners. I ain't lying. She like, yeah, I ate that. Look at him. He is shook. He like, oh my God. <laughs> Clyburn's influence in the district. Remember that a significant majority of South Carolina voters in 2020 said they voted for Joe Biden precisely because of Jim Clyburn's endorsement, as opposed to anything particular about Joe Biden. He really is a kingmaker in the state. He also, as you pointed out, uh, has one of the poorest districts in the country. And perhaps unrelatedly in terms of his political affiliations, has taken more money from the pharmaceutical industry than any other member yeah. of Congress. Now, as back to the Simone Sanders tweet and the backlash, um, you did see a lot of people making exactly that point in response to her tweet saying, what about the genocide? You're talking about hollow ground uh, in a church when people are protesting Israel's bombing of the third oldest church in the entire world that is in Gaza and the treatment of so many Palestinian Christians who have died in the birthplace of Christianity. Christi uh, Christmas, obviously, uh, we remember was canceled this year in the birthplace of Jesus. And of course, a former Congress member, Christian Congress member, two uh, family members were killed pretty early on uh, in this conflict. I, I, I want <laughs> to ask you about the it on kind of thing. racial Girl, dynamics of this as they played out in the wake of this controversy. One of the initial accusations was that these were white protesters that were disrupting a black space. And there was a clear kind of identity politics pivot that was made by the Democratic Party to say these are pesky white protesters. Mm. Um, that show no respect for the black community you ain't and trying to pit the black community, which has shown so much solidarity for the Palestinian cause uh, against the Palestinian community, both the United States of America and in the diaspora. What do you make of that choice? Mm -hmm. And what, what is the truth of what was happening there in the church? you ain't Joe Biden if you don't care about if you care if you about want to prepare people. for the gas shortage. You ain't Joe Biden if you don't give a damn about. <laughs> Or if you do, my double negatives are confusing me, but you are not Joe Biden if you care about black people. <laughs> You're not Joe Biden or Brandon Johnson. Oh yeah, I gotta, don't don't worry, Brandon, I'm getting Just back in to winter you. and save big on energy bills, then you need to hear this. This new space heater warms any room in less than five minutes while using 90% less energy. This ingenious there was also, if you look at the woman standing next to uh, the, the white woman there, there was a black person there too as well. But the thing is, is that you should be disrupting these spaces whenever these politicians are present. Period, they this is where Joe Biden space. chose to be present at that point in time, regardless if it's a black church, regardless if it's uh, a school, regardless if it's a fundraiser that these politicians are attending. You should disrupt all spaces in effort to Power cease to fire in says. reference to a genocide. Uh, I can't even believe people are using uh, this type of excuse when they're sitting up here carrying weight for, for a president of the United States who called wrote the crime bill like this Period. is just absolutely ridiculous now he's complicit in a genocide anything to protect the status quo anything to protect the democratic party which is a corporate organization we have to push back against the status quo in this country and i don't know what it's going to take at this point i do know that jim clyburn for example did have a challenger Bro, uh, i believe like marcel is running against jim clyburn again like i don't know what more it's going to take for people to really wake up and understand that the status Status quo is leading us to a dead zone in this country. And if we want some type of real concessions for the black community, we're going to have to push some of these former black leaders to the side and we need new leadership. That's what it's really going to take. But I think that's an excuse that they tried to use. Uh, of course, they tried to play this card. How dare they even show up in that space in the first place? Well, Joe Biden <laughs> is, is in that is. space and Joe Biden is an African-American. That's not really what it's about. Wow. They just didn't like the fact that they interrupted <laughs> the idea to protest. Are, are you sure? Did <laughs> the idea? She interrupted. Hey, That's not really what it's about. Wow. They just did. Biden is in that space tried to use uh, of course they tried to play this card how dare they even show up in that space in the first place well joe biden is in that space and joe biden is an african-american that's not really what it's about wow. they just didn't like the fact that they interrupted <laughs> the idea to protest 
Are, are you sure he's, he's not African-American? Because I have a hard time imagining him that a, a white uh, presidential candidate would turn to the black community and say, you ain't black if you don't support me. I'm joking, of course. We should just um, also mention, I don't know that we know actually the race of this woman in the middle. Uh, she very may well be Palestinian. And we also should note, because we didn't do it so up top, and we cut the clip off a little bit early, the, the free Palestine um, uh, cheers and advocates were drowned out by the rest of the crowd chanting four more years. And some folks thought that was a really interesting um, demonstration of the priorities of the Democratic Party that calls for peace and a ceasefire would be responded to with a political cry. I also just wanted to read one tweet from uh, journalist Terrell Jermaine uh, Starr, who I think represented uh, some interesting pushback here. He said, if you invite politics into the pulpit by inviting a presidential candidate to speak at a church, you welcome debate in the pews. Do you think there's something to that, that you open the door to this kind of a political uh, response if you turn a church, a house of into worship, a into place. a pulpit for a political exercise. Yeah. That's right. I mean, everyone that attends this event isn't necessarily supposed to agree with Joe Biden and praise and applaud Joe Biden. Right. Uh, we have we're supposed to have free speech in this country. Right. So we're supposed to welcome uh, those opportunities. But the thing is, is that when we look at people again, like the puppet sitting next to him, Jim Clyburn, he has these churches in his back pocket. This is why so many people he was able to convince them to come out and support Joe Biden instead of Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. because Jim Clyburn has black churches on speed dial. He's able to win over that congregation. And that's all it takes. And people have to understand that a lot of this, when we talk about politics and how people choose to vote in reference to the black community, a lot of it starts with the black church. So that is where you have to go to make some type of change. If Jim, if Jim Clyburn was serious about progress in this country, all he would have to do was say, listen, guys, this has not been working. We've been supporting the Democratic Party. It is time for us to move outside of this vehicle. And it is time for us to honestly push towards some type of third party or independent race because they actually haven't been helping the African-American community. They would follow him, Bree. They would go where he will go. That's the thing. So Jim Clyburn and people like him, mm -hmm. they are holding us back. And that's a big what? problem. Hmm. Baby girl. Sabby Sabs, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Sorry, let's get our name one Sabby more time. Sabby Sabs, thank you for us back. And that's a big problem. Hmm. Sabby Sabs, thank you so Sabby much for joining Sabs, us. We really girl. appreciate it. Sabby, you ate that girl. Thank you. She knows she ate that. Oh, she ate. Okay, I'm sorry. I like, I like when the girls eat. I love when the girls eat. <sighs> All right, so, um, honey, yes. Um, so let's get on back on to, so we see Joe Biden is a piece of S and we see, uh, these black politicians are POSs and well, let's go back to our very own POS. Mr. Brandon Johnson. Check this out, y'all. Question. If the migrant buses keep rolling in, a new year brings new hope for more resources. Mayor Brandon Johnson reiterated his call for more federal help during a virtual meeting with Illinois' two senators he don't want to and see the Chicago area congressional delegation. The federal government has a responsibility to aid and assist local governments. No local government is equipped to deal with crises. Of this is Jason Lee, the mayor's aide. We're going to see him in a minute. I just want y'all to remember. Remember his face. <laughs> this scale. Congressional members told Johnson they will continue to push President Biden for more help. We are in conversation with the administration and Secretary Mayorkas in figuring out a way to get Chicago money as soon as possible. Money, money. What else are we trying to get Chicago? But money coming from Congress will be a big challenge. Democrats blame far right Republicans for holding up the budget, including aid for you. Budget means money, money. Ukraine, they're <laughs> threatening a partial government shutdown unless Congress enacts strict changes to immigration law. Oh, how dare you want money when we want money, money, money. <laughs> how dare you want us to enforce laws when we just want the money, money from Ukraine, money for Ukraine, money, money to give to the asylum seekers. Oh, not them, just the cities. They say we gonna help them. Sorry. Now you're saying <laughs> we're going to tie those critical foreign policy oh. objectives 
on a domestic issue that we've never gotten done. Oh, but no, like you didn't frame it right. Let me tell you, sir. <laughs> How are you going to tie these very, very pressing issues that are about to cause the complete collapse of American democracy? How do you tie that issue to a budget? <laughs> now, now it sounds better. See, because like we got to think country budget. Mm, do I want a budget or do I want a country? Because you don't have the budget without the country. Ask Venezuela. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's a blueprint for getting <laughs> nothing done. Democrats say Republicans are only interested in shutting the border down, not compromise. Meantime, better coordination with other Chicago area municipalities was also discussed during today's mayoral meeting. The other piece of that is also is how do we continue to strengthen our relationship among units of government to make sure that we are maximizing the amount of funding we can get. Bro, she's she focused on the money. She's very focused on the money. She didn't mention the humanitarian part of it. Not one time. Interesting take. Through county, through state, <laughs> through local. Also discussed at today's meeting between Mayor Johnson and the congressional delegation was more federal resources to help migrants with the work permit process. Watch breaking news on YouTube. Please, Subscribe. please, please help us get these people to work. They are here and they're really staying. <laughs> I thought I would turn him away with my bad politics <laughs> and constant crying, mixing with the wind and snow. <laughs> it's like El Nino. <laughs> it's like Yorono. <laughs> Yorono black guy. <laughs> All right. And then, so yeah, Jason Lee, who is he? Jason Lee, who is he? Oh, oh I opened that in Apple News. So, uh, Day Watch, Johnson administration fired staffers who complain about mistreatment. Brandon Johnson. Uh, oh, excuse me. Brandon Johnson's administration. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I can see that. Awesome. Brandon Johnson's administration. Uh, you're, you're not helping me? Like, I didn't, I didn't want that to happen. <laughs> I didn't want that to happen. There we go. Otra vez. Otra vez. Otra vez. All right. Here we go. So, Brandon Johnson's administration fired three city staffers after they complained about how they were treated by high-ranking officials. Records show. The episode unfolded early in the administration, and its fallout continued into the autumn. It offers a window into the bumpy transition in the mayor's office from Lori Lightfoot to Johnson. All right, so two days after Johnson was inaugurated in May, top city hall advisor Jason Lee walked into a press aide's office and began yelling, according to a complaint filed by former deputy director of digital strategy Dora Mesa with the state's human rights department and the city inspector general. Lee was upset with the digital team made up of people hired during the Lightfoot administration who had stayed on after Johnson took office for not posting a photo recap of Johnson's appearance at the NBA draft combine. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> to the mayor's Twitter, <laughs> Facebook, and Instagram pages. Oh, my God. <laughs> According to the complaint Mesa filed, Mesa said she told Lee they were holding on posting content because they were live streaming the funeral for slain police officer Ariana Preston. Press, co uh, excuse me, press office colleague Ashley Rodriguez was also present, told, uh, both told the Tribune. During the interaction, Lee constantly hovered over Mesa as she sat in her desk, raised his voice, used profane language, rolled his eyes, and kept holding his head in his hands, according to the complaint. 
The women said they were upset by the way Lee spoke to them and later felt shut out of the decision-making process as well as the culture at City Hall. Their boss at the time, Josue Ortiz, said they had slumped shoulders and looked upset when he returned to the office and they confided it to him about the incident afterward, he told the Tribune. So I don't have the... the uh, infrastructure <laughs> currently in place to read the rest of that article. So we're going to switch on over to, um, to video. Let's see. Developing controversy at City Hall, Mayor Brandon Johnson administration fired three staffers after they complained that they were mistreated. The city then placed those names on the do not hire list, which is usually reserved for those accused of serious offenses. The do not hire list is pretty serious business. It's intended to protect the city from people who have a demonstrated track record of improper, illegal, threatening conduct. The three. I don't know about y'all, but this feels like foreshadowing, but <laughs> allegedly. <laughs> Staffers have now filed complaints with the Chicago Inspector General, the Attorney General, and the state's Human Rights Office. The mayor's press secretary sending us this statement saying, quote, we will not comment on specific personnel matters, but wholeheartedly reject any claims of inappropriate behavior or employee retaliation. Employee turnover is inevitable and and an inspected part of any administration change. Developing controversy at City Hall, Mayor Brandon Johnson administration fired three. Anyway, so you put these people on a do not hire list as though they're like sex offenders or something when they literally saved your ass from looking like a narcissistic asshole because who wants to post videos or pictures of themselves at an NBA draft combine while a funeral of a slain police officer is live streaming. Day two on the job, this was Mr. Lee's priority for the Johnson administration, huh? And y'all, I know y'all gonna be like, well, Brandon Johnson can't control what his staff members do. Like y'all were trying to defend him for putting hands on Emma Mitts, um, um, Ramirez Rosa for grabbing on uh, Alderman uh, Mitts. Uh, excuse me. Um, if you place someone in a position, if you appoint them, if you choose them and you put them in your administration or your cabinet, you are co-signing their behavior. So for y'all to try to excuse somebody because he's a grown man and he has no control over this other man, but he gave him the position, meaning he trusted him to execute according to his will. Have y'all not watched Game of Thrones? <laughs> I mean, like, it's the right hand. It's the hand of the king. Like, what are y'all, what are you talking about? Anyone within that administration is acting within the full authority of that administration. Anyone who is deemed to not be doing so with the permission or the um, blessing of the administration should be literally called out. And, and sent away. <laughs> and, and, and if they're doing something egregious enough to be placed on a do not hire list, then they should be. However, if they're not, they should just be relieved of their duties if they are going above what you've called for them to do um, or acting outside of their capacity or doing something that doesn't represent your administration's um your administration's uh, standards or of of behavior or anything, or, you know, principles. So if you don't call it out and condemn it, you are complicit. Just like those protesters pro protesting against genocide in Palestine. If you're not speaking out against the genocide, you are complicit. So let's stop allowing people to do the wrong thing y'all were all in a, a tizzy about cat williams and talking about how he ate everybody up and he got integrity and the receipts is coming well let's look at your own receipts every time you vote one of these knuckleheads in where's the receipt on that every time you turn the other way when somebody under this man's administration does something that is just completely egregious and outlandish how many times you gonna 
turn the other way. So I'm going to wrap this up with the fact that y'all actually are sitting here trying to convince us that it's okay to send COVID money for the migrants um, when we all know that COVID disproportionately affected um, the black community, right? Disproportionately. Let's see, can I... Yay. Okay. So let's see. Can I pull this up for the final here? But yeah. So uh, this is a study, COVID-19 viewpoint, social vulnerability and equity, the disproportionate impact of COVID-19. COVID-19 emerged of unknown origins in the last quarter of 2019, first gaining global attention from an outbreak of respiratory illness in Wuhan, China. Okay, so we all know about all that. Okay, it's bad. It was bad. Okay, pressure in the chest, confusion. Um, some people were uh, asymptomatic and passing along, but some people who were symptomatic had trouble breathing, coughing, persistent muscle pain, pressure in the chest, confusion. According to the CDC, twenty twenty. That's right there. The symptoms of COVID. Okay, uh, like the symptoms of American racism. Pressure and pain that stifles one's ability to breathe and move freely. Did you hear that? Did you hear that, Brandon? You for my people, right? I hope you're hearing this. The symptoms of COVID are in many ways like the symptoms of American racism. Pressure and pain that stifles one's ability to breathe and move freely. Outcomes associated with the daily conditions of black life in the most vulnerable communities predispose black people to a host of disparities, health and otherwise. Bad politics being one of them, namely. Uh, okay. So outcomes, hold on, let me see if I got this on a single page. All right. So there we go. All right. And so, uh, outcomes. Oh, I, I read that. So, uh, where did I leave off? So, uh, here we go. COVID-19 for some further exposes and reiterates for others half a millennium of structural racism and repression targeted with administrative precision on the black body. Ooh, we, this is Eden. Y'all want me to read that again? COVID for some further exposes and reiterates for others half a millennium of structural racism and repression targeted with administrative precision on the black body. Sound like a mayor, I know. Sound like a president, I know. As the architect of racial disparity, racism also shapes the vulnerability of communities. Social vulnerability, excuse me, socially vulnerable communities were created through political decisions such as redlining, gentrification, and industrialization. Are, and are less resilient in their ability to respond to and recover from natural and human-made disasters compared with higher-resourced communities. A pandemic can be a migrant crisis, can it not? Invasion of a virus into your body, invasion of your neighborhoods. 65% of the, the United States thinks this is what this is. Don't say I'm wrong. Ask us all. <laughs> you can't put it on me. Okay. What it looked like, especially if they're going to predominantly brown and black communities or poor communities where people are already dealing with the consequences of that let alone COVID, and then now you shoving some more shit down their throat and moving their money that was was budgeted for them to somebody else while they still suffering. But you understand the black community. You ain't black. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention defines social vulnerability as 
the resilience of communities when confronted by external stresses on human health, stresses such as natural or human caused diseases, excuse me, disasters or disease outbreaks. Socially vulnerable communities and those living within them may not be able to respond to COVID in ways that limit the spread and deathly impact of the virus. In this essay, we argue that racism exposes structures structures, excuse me, policies and practices that have created social vulnerability. It exposed those things. So it's very much within the consciousness of our framework, right? We all can see this right now. We still can see we should have been saw and we definitely should still remember, especially if we found the COVID money. Consequently, those vulnerabilities have interacted with the effects of COVID-19 in such a way that has led to disproportionate infection and death rates of black people in the United States. Disproportionate, I say. To make this argument, we use the CDC's Social Vulnerability Index, SVI, to analyze the way in which black bodies occupy the most vulnerable communities, making them bear the brunt of COVID's impact. Because of high-level vulnerability, in black communities, the pathogen of racism carries CVID in such a way that it permeates every aspect of black life. By using the SVI, we are able to locate the vulnerabilities in a county and examine the relationship between social vulnerability and the black infection and death rates due to CVID. Ultimately, we seek to understand whether there is a relationship between social vulnerability and the disparate impact of CVID on black bodies. And so we look at those rates by state. Uh oh, let's see if I can. There we go. So, rate of black CVID deaths by state. Can y'all see that? Uh, I was trying to do this as one continuous. There we go. All right, so if we're looking at this, you see the percent of deaths, 81% in D.C., 44% in Michigan, 57% in South Carolina, 35% in, uh, so this was data as of April 27, 2020, okay? Um, so this was in the first few months of CVID, okay? Uh, 35% Kansas, 61% Louisiana. Now remember, this is by state. So if we're the population minority, we're going to, we're going to typically be a smaller percentage of that, but you see how we're leading in areas. So, okay. District of Columbia, you know, is heavily black. So that makes a lot of sense there. Right. Then we get to Michigan. That looks, you see what I'm saying? So it checks out based on how heavy or how densely populated uh, the black communities are in those in those um, states, right? And so obviously Kansas is not gonna have a lot of black people, but then you look at Louisiana, of course, right? Missouri, Wisconsin, Illinois, 39%, 63% Mississippi. So very black areas, that's where you lost a lot of black people. Okay, and then this crisis and then you find CVID money to help those people. I'm just saying it don't look real good on you, sir. 44% in Maryland, so, uh, so on and so forth. So the more, you know, less black population that these states are known for, the smaller those those numbers get. Um, and so uh, let's see. I think there was a few more highlights I made up here. So I was going to read from, let's see, Living as the Vulnerable. Do I want to read this whole thing? Yeah, so I just want to read this. On March 31st, 2020, when referring to the CVID virus, um, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo tweeted, this virus is the great equalizer. Okay. Madonna, in an Instagram post that was later deleted, stated, what's terrible about, terrible about it is that it made us all equal in many ways. And what's wonderful about it is that it's made us all equal 
in many ways. While perhaps well-intentioned, Governor Cuomo's tweet in Madonna's post advanced a wider narrative that suggests that everyone, despite their social group membership, had the same potential to be impacted by the virus in a similar way. In similar ways. However, the great equalizer narrative, which has gained some traction on media outlets, runs counter to the historical patterns evident in disasters throughout U.S. history. Emergency management researchers have demonstrated that the impact of emergency events is not random, but is rather informed, hold your horses, by everyday patterns of social interaction and organization, particularly the resulting stratification paradigms which determine access to resources, meaning those existing oppressive systems lay the groundwork for further oppression through a crisis. Your great equalizer does not exist. Existing in inequitable social structures and conditions facilitate vastly different realities for more vulnerable communities and individuals when coping with and being resilient to disaster events. As population characteristics directly impact social vulnerability in context of natural and human-made disasters, it would seem to also hold true with the CVID pandemic, perhaps, rather than the great equalizer. CVID is the great revealer of the persistent inequity that has caused longstanding social vulnerability. Preliminary data indicate that people of color, primarily black people, people are overwhelmingly and disproportionately affected by the spread of the CVID virus. In fact, CDC reported that as of May 15, 2020, 40% of the national CVID hospitalizations were non-Hispanic black people compared with 36.5% of non-Hispanic white, 14.2% of Hispanic, 9.3% of others. When comparing these hospitalization hospitalization rates with population estimates, black people are, according to these data, hospitalized at a rate almost 3.1 times their population size and the only racial group drastically above their population estimates, where black people make up 13.4% of the U.S. population. They represent 40% of CVID-related hospitalizations. This disproportionate impact is also evident at the state level. In, in Illinois, black people represent 14% of the state's population, yet 41% of those who have died from CVID reported as of May 2020, Illinois Department of Public Health 2020. Black people make up 14% of Michigan's population, but 40% of the CVID cases. So like I was saying, it's it's disproportionate. Um, so I highlighted down here too, a community's ability to respond to and recover from disastrous events rests on social and economic resources like your federal money that was set aside for us, the already disenfranchised community, but you found a surplus and decided, nah, I'm not going to pass it to y'all. I'm going to pass it to the migrants. Joe Byron, take me to dinner. Being able to... <laughs> Being able to carry out the recommended practices of flattening the curve to flatten the curve and slow the spread of CVID requires individuals and communities access to the privileges that afford such a response. This is Charles Blow, 2020, illustrated in a 2020, April 2020, New York Times opinion piece that the privilege of social distancing is not an option for many in the black community. Black people make up large percentages of the essential workforce. And frontline jobs, including workers in grocery and courier delivery, postal service, public and urban transport, and health care. Therefore, those who are working are less able to engage in social distancing practices. As for many, social distancing would mean no income. Further, the Pew Research Center 2020 revealed that black survey respondents are twice as likely to know someone who has been hospitalized or died from CVID. These disparities underscore the presence of institutional racism in existing public systems, examples, housing, 
uh, industrial health care, public education, employment patterns, among many others, and the failure of systemic public administration to address the race-based inequities that left communities vulnerable to heightened CVID impacts. So if you want to look into that a little more, you can, but um, y'all get the gist of it. There is clearly an impact on our community for all sorts of disasters, be they of a natural variety or human created, human caused disasters. One of those which would be what we are current currently experiencing that you wanted to deflect funds towards even though you have yet to deal with our disasters and then i saw something i don't know if i played it here but i know i just saw something where he essentially wants to buy votes by offering a reparation study let me see if i can pull that up real real quick final 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 so you 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 gonna s on us over here on cvid but then you're gonna go find a reparation study to do i mean but sir (laughs) but sir Well, since taking office a little bit over seven months ago, uh, my administration um, has responded to this humanitarian (laughs) mission. The comments are my favorite. The Um, The whole U.S. agrees. 15,000 people living in (laughs) shelters, temporary shelters here in Chicago, Um, nearly 27 shelters uh, total, uh, 4,500 children in our Chicago public schools uh, system, providing health care. Um, and also making sure that um, we are screening individuals as they come through the city of Chicago, uh, providing, again, on-site uh, vaccinations at all of our shelters. Now. And this certainly has been um, a remarkable challenge that my administration has had to face, and quite frankly, a challenge that we are experiencing all over the country. But let me just say this and make this very Oh my God, I can't, I, I just can't, I can't. You guys go find it, because I can't, I can't listen to him. He disturbs he disturbs my peace. So yeah, I'm I'm done. Um, so they um, yeah they they want to do a reparation study. I saw it somewhere. Let me see if I can just find like an article. Reparations. Brandon Johnson irritates me. This was December, I guess in life, November. So yeah, he he talked about this back in November. So this isn't something recently that he brought up, but uh, people are uh, <laughs> people are like, bro, oh yeah, because he recently said. So this is what it is. Recently, he said that reparations would reduce crime. Yeah. That that news made it to the UK, baby. They want to know what turns us on. Black America. Oh, 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 oh. Fried fish and Joe Biden. Mm. And if you say you're going to give us some reparations money, except some of us Uncle Toms, we like, I don't want that. <laughs> I want it. I want my money. If you're going to pay me, pay me. Go ahead. But I do know it's not going to solve it's not going to solve the problems. <laughs> it won't solve the problems. <laughs> but I want to know. I want to know where where is my reparations? <laughs> All right, y'all. So, hopefully um our dear sweet 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 mayor Maya Brandon finds a way to resolve this whole thing. I'm sorry, I'm just smacking in your ear. But yeah, I'm sick of him, bro. And so, I mean, as you can see, he can't be that progressive, right? If he's firing people and putting them on the do not hire list and basically creating hostile work environments, that's not progressive. That's not, that's very not progressive. 
He doesn't clearly respect the prior administration and any of her decisions or anything that she laid the groundwork for. So you came in with a scorched earth policy, which many people do, but it wouldn't be wise of you to do that when you have absolutely no government experience or you have what you have is minimal and useless to us at this point. Clearly, it's showing up in the wash. And then... You have the audacity to be getting rid of her people, not working with the city council, not working with uh, different people who have the experience because you don't want to look like you don't know what you're doing. But, sir, it's too late. Can't keep talking about Greg Abbott. Can't keep having another man's name in your mouth more than your own saliva. It just isn't a good look. It doesn't work on any level. I am concerned for you. Please stop. Um, yeah, so Jason Lee, out of pocket. I hope those people get whatever they got coming to them because how dare you mystery people who are trying to keep you out of trouble because I guarantee you if they would have did what you said and posted that video, you would look really dumb and insensitive and you would have blamed them and they would have gotten fired for that anyway. So they were like in a no-win situation but you can sit here and be like oh I don't talk about personal issues well you need to be talking about your mental issues because something's wrong because you cannot call yourself progressive and you cannot say you're for the black community when you consistently are doing things that are completely not aligned with those those perspectives okay not if you're an advocate so Thank y'all. Uh, this is a very long video that I'm going to have to edit up to shorten up. So I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for uh, following, liking, subscribing, sharing, commenting. If you have any other ideas or opinions on this, please let me know below. I always want to hear what you think. I am always open for discussion. Um, and then I plan to do a live hopefully very soon. Uh, said I'm going to try to do one once a month. So I'm working on it. Um, but I will see you guys, you know, keep your head up, stay positive and keep fighting a good fight. Don't punk out and don't fold because people don't agree with you um, because people are short sighted and because people want to keep you quiet so that they can maintain the status quo um, because we've been through enough with the pandemic and we are trying to move the culture forward. But we got these old timers and these uh, people who've already gotten their money counted up that want to, you know, keep things stagnant and continue to oppress and 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 basically marginalize everybody. Like, I mean, it's not just the black community. It's honestly is, you know, that's why Trump is who he is. And that's why he was able to get to where he got was because he was the voice of, even though he can't really relate, but he was the voice of, you know, poor white men in America, young men in America of all races who are just like, I cannot understand where I'm supposed to win at here because it looks like the game is rigged. And so Trump came in and, and spoke to that and y'all mad about it instead of studying it and figuring out where you went wrong and telling the protesters in the church to shut up. You should be trying to figure out where you went wrong with the youth, where you went wrong with the black community, where you went wrong with white men. If that's what you really want. But you are, you're not considering that because you think we're dumb and you think we're just going to be afraid of Trump. Y'all done tried y'all best to keep him off the ballot. That is to me, very unethical. And then you want to come out now calling him a loser. I saw Biden said something today. He's a loser. But look, sir, check this out. Losers go around calling people losers. <laughs> right? Because a winner don't have to call nobody a loser because he just wins. He don't even got time today. He's, he's on to getting more wins. You don't go around calling people losers when you're a winner. You just go win. <laughs> Yeti. So I don't understand. You don't want to get on the stage and debate the man because you're going to look see now, but you want to get on the stage by yourself and call the man a loser. That sounds like a punk to me. That sounds like a punk. You want you want to talk about him about having the capital storm and people don't want to accept the results of the election, but you won't even let this man get on the damn ballot in two states, which now the Supreme Court is going to see and we will know 
February 8th when they hear it, what will go down, okay? But uh, until then, hold on to your hats. Um, but the fact that you're trying to censor this man, he's been on gag orders, and then you're trying to take him off the ballot, it's very much not giving we win elections, we are winners. It's giving, I'm scared for my life, mama stop that man, mama please. <laughs> So Eric Adams, good luck to you. Brandon Johnson, good luck to you. You guys are being very vocal. It's not helping. Uh, Denver's mayor, I have, I don't hear much from him. Louisiana's mayor, I don't hear much from her. But it seems as though, and the other one I can't remember, but it seems as though you all, I think San Diego, it seems as though you all have seen for yourself the perils that Brandon and Eric are going through and you've decided, you know what, it's best I just be quiet and quietly suffer um, because Biden ain't home. Okay. Biden ain't home. Uh, so take me out to dinner, Joe. We all want to go. All right. See ya. <laughs> sleepy Ugh. all right anyway all right so um y'all can't see that let's try again try your game turn the page <laughs> something's wrong with me <laughs>